Am oh, I there? Yeah. Hello. Oh. <laughs> mouse, my mouse died on me, of course, right at the critical <laughs> moment. Sandra, my Hello. favorite roomie. <laughs> That's right. We need to go on another trip so we can be roommates again. We do. I'm Kathy Reichs. Uh, I write the Temperance Brennan novels. And of course, this is Sandra Brown. And Sandra and I did some USO tours together. We went to Afghanistan together and we shared a bee hut together. <laughs> we had a little bit more upmarket uh, digs in Cuba. Right. A little and bit more. I fully expected today, just as when we were in the desert in Afghanistan, every single day, Sandra Brown looked completely elegant and well and completely well put together, while as I looked like I was in the desert. <laughs> that is so not true. <laughs> but thank so you. True. And today I'm at the beach and I look like I'm at the beach and Sandra looks her usual Sandra Brown elegant. So well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks Good to so see much. you. <laughs> So we are going, today is your book birthday for right. and we're going to talk about that. Overkill. There it is. Congratulations. Thank you. And I'm terrible at thinking of what questions I, I think of a zillion questions while I'm on my own here falling asleep. And then when I go on air, it's like, Ugh. so I have actually written some questions down here. Okay. You're forgiven. I'd have to do the same thing. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to ask you a few questions and this is, this book started out seriously sexy heavy. I um, mean, the, the party, there's a party going on and she's <laughs> taking off their clothes and everything. So that was pretty cool. And it, you know, you got your typical Sandra Brown suspense, but also all the sexy romantic scenes as well. I'm always afraid to do that. I don't put sex into my books. Um, how do you do that? How do you balance the light with the heavy, I guess is what I'm trying to ask. Well, in this particular book, I didn't even write that prologue until after I had gotten about 10 or 12 chapters in. And I didn't really want to reveal what happened, but I wanted to set up the, the situation, you know, that because Rebecca, the the woman who is a who is in a persistent vegetative state, uh, had led a pretty wild life. And I mean, and she's such a uh, you know, she's talked about all the time throughout the book, but we never, we never see her, we never hear her, except in that prologue. And so I thought it's really kind of doing the reader a disservice, you know, not to set up the situation and exactly what her life was like prior to that night that she went into the bedroom <laughs> with three men. And, um, but in terms of combining the light and the dark, you know, from, the books you've written, you know, so wonderful and everything that every scene is hard to write. So whether I'm writing a, a heavy scene, a suspenseful scene, uh, or if it's a bedroom scene, it still takes the same amount of time. It still makes it takes the same amount of concentration. And I'm concentrating not so much on the sensuality, which I hope comes up out of writing, but it's how to structure the sentences, how to, you know, bring the emotional level into it and how to. So it's it's as hard for me to write one kind of scene as it is for another. And I don't think of them as as heavy or light, dark or bright. They're all heavy <laughs> and dark. When you're writing, <laughs> exactly, when you're at the keyboard. My son once told me, years ago when he was younger that I don't have a lot of sexy scenes. I have cutaway sex, you know, we don't, <laughs> but he said, I'm not reading your books anymore because it's my mother. And I just, can't right, just right, 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 right. I get that. I get that I, for all the time. Sometimes, it, it, especially when I meet someone for the first time, people have known me for years, you know, it, it that wore off a long time ago. But if I meet someone uh, for the first time and they'll go, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure I can look you in the eye. <laughs> you know? And one of the actors one time who who read several books from me, uh, Stephen Lang, I met him and he he said, you know, I'm in there, I'm reading this and it's so good. And he said, I look up and all the technicians are on the other side of the window, you know, like, wow. <laughs> and he said, 
And I said, well, you know, some of those, some of those words are hard for me to, to write even to this day, but it's, it's my job. It's not me. And anybody that knows me knows that it's not me. That's work. It's different. You know, you can write about a killer. Well, I can do that. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Here's a question that occurred to me very early in the book. Did you set out to write about a former football superstar right from the beginning? Or did you come up with Zach's character after realizing you wanted a protagonist who was also a celebrity? Yeah, I knew from the beginning, from the outset, that it was going to be a celebrity. And the reason that that came about is because during COVID, when we were hearing all these horrible stories about families who were having to remove their loved one from life support because they didn't have a good chance of surviving anyway and giving that respirator to someone who did have a better chance of survival. So these stories were so heartrending to me. I just thought, what an awful situation to be in. And even though they might have been on the nightly news, we'd hear it one day and then they were you know, they were off our radar, but what if, play the what if game, what if you had somebody who was very well known and about that say that who was having to make a decision like this in a spotlight, a global spotlight. And about that same time, Tom Brady was going through his do I retire, do or I not, you know, phase. And I thought, I love football. Uh, what if this was, you know, the MVP quarterback of the Super Bowl and he was having to make a decision like this with everybody in the world having an opinion on what he should do. Either way he went, he was either going to be very right or very wrong, depending on someone else's standpoint on the subject. So I thought it would be so much more difficult to deal with what should be an extremely private, personal matter um, between you and your family, between you and your religious beliefs, between you and your own heart and soul, your own humanity, and do it in such a public, you know, format. So that's why I decided to make him a football player, but I also just happened to like football. And I thought he would be an interesting character. You have to do a lot of research into the football part. Because <laughs> <No. laughs> uh, I, had, I had a uh, someone else this week interviewing me asked that there are so many analogies, you know, to football and you you use it to make a point or to give him motivation or to you know, provide justification for something. And they said, boy, you sure must have had to do research. I said, I knew this stuff growing up. You know, I learned football at my, you know, in my living room every Sunday afternoon. So I I grew up on football. So a lot of it, no, I didn't have to look that part up. Part I had to do a lot of research on was the something, someone being in Rebecca's condition and how, you know, how that would, how that would be. That was the thing. And then also finding the loophole in the divorce situation where Zach would have remained her agent of record, even though they had been divorced. So I had to do a lot of, in which state, you know, certain rules applied and some, some did it. And so that was, that was my initial research. With doctors and lawyers. Right. <laughs> Which are always complicated. <laughs> I'd much rather write a book about football. <laughs> uh, let's see what else. Um, well, I think you kind of answered this, the, the idea of fame, being famous and the consequences right. of being famous, the consequences of which are both positive and they're negative. And that's kind of a driving force uh, in this novel, as I saw. Right. How do you think it would have been? The cost of fame. How do you think it would have been different if your main characters were just regular people or would it have been? Yeah. Well, I I don't think that the torture one would have to go through to make that kind of decision would have been any different. Stripped away from all the football stuff, Zach was still a human being, you know, and and uh, and he felt for family. He also, which is revealed in the middle of the book, he also had another 
what I consider to be a very valid reason why he decided just to leave the scene and let things unfold as they would. Uh, but, and I don't want to give that aspect away, but uh, if it had been, if it had been a, a family in, in maybe they had their own, you know, crisis going on or their own differences of opinion, it would have been a different novel. But in terms of dealing with the situation, it still comes down to the human heart and soul and mind and what one thinks about in terms of, you know, all of those things that I, that I named before. I think for um, the reader, it would probably be more interesting having someone like a, we're always interested in celebrity, <laughs> you know, we're overwhelmed by celebrity, social media and everything. So uh, I think it, it kind of, it put it in a spotlight that made for a better, juicier read, maybe. You said that um, COVID, the, the COVID-19 pandemic was a big inspiration for the Rebecca plot line. Um, when you started writing the book, I know when I started writing my last book, I had to think consciously about how am I going to deal with pand the pandemic? Am I going right. to actively incorporate it? Am I going to ignore it? Am I going to give it lip service? Did you go through that process? Well, I, I wrote, during COVID, I wrote Blind Tiger, which was set in 1920, simply because I, I was like you. I was like, how am I going to incorporate you know, all of this into any kind, and I was frankly saturated, you know, I, I, I was sick of hearing about it, and I felt like, well, readers will be, so I just thought, I'll write a historical novel where I don't have to deal with it, but then when I went back to 1920, they were having a Spanish flu pandemic globally, so, it, you know, nothing much had changed, but, um, when I came out of a blind tiger, it was going to go back to contemporary and write uh, a more typical Sandra Brown book. Uh, I thought I'll just ignore it. I'll just ignore it. I'll just pretend that it it doesn't exist. So the the aspect of taking her off life support, you know, wasn't caused by the pandemic, and so I I could get around that. I could avoid that. But at the same time, I think that situation that families were confronted with, uh, having to remove one, make that decision that no one should have to make. Um, I think people could relate to it because it had been so recent, you know, in all the stories about COVID. Moving on, you stepped on my next question. So oh. <laughs> See, we roomed together, so now we're thinking alike. <laughs> after um, after Rebecca's assault and Zach, Zach unexpectedly holds responsibility for all these medical decisions on her dis behalf, despite the fact that they've been divorced forever, is his choice to leave all the related decisions to her parents, do you see that as a kindness or just a kind of a deflection of responsibility? I think it was really both. And, and this is one of the things I had to, and that's why I kind of incorporated that thing in the middle of the book, we learned there was another circumstance of which, you know, no one was aware except him. Uh, so I, I, I kind of went back and forth on that. Is this just an act of cowardice? Just saying, you know, screw this. I'm not going to be a part of this. It's not my problem. Um, I gave Zach more credit than that. I don't think he would have done it. Uh, and he had already pretty much made up his mind before he found out the other factor. And, uh, uh, but then I think he too was, I think he felt for her parents, even though they didn't treat him kindly. Um, so it, I, I feel like it would have been much the way I would have acted. I can't speak for everyone, but I, I think it would have been, I would have felt all the conflicting things that he did. But in the end of it, it was like, you know, they didn't want me. I didn't want me. I really think if Rebecca had it to do over again, she wouldn't want me to be in charge of her decision. And so I'm just going to abdicate. And he did it as gracefully as he could. But then 
it ruined his head. You know, it was like uh, he, he, the event itself, having to make that decision is what brought about his, the loss of his mind game and the, the you know, the, the downfall of his career. Kate comes along. She comes, she's a, the prosecutor in search of <clears throat> the, in the hunt for justice. Do you think her presence changed Zach's point of view with regard to keeping Rebecca on life support? Or does she force him to acknowledge what he's already known for, you know, for years? I think that's a really interesting question. I wondered that myself. I think it was, uh, here again, I, I'm middle of the roading it, but, uh, but I really think that he wanted nothing to do with it at the beginning. You know, I, I dealt with that four years ago. I've moved on. It ruined my career. I, you know, I live up here in the mountains. I don't want to fool with it. And her family certainly doesn't want me to get more involved. At the same time, things that she said prompted him to make the trip uh, to go and see Rebecca's situation for himself and to talk to the doctor. And I think that it was that visit to her room in the hospital that is where I call it the 100, 125 page flip. It's where up to that point, he had been absolutely adamant, no, get out of my life, go away, don't want to hear it, don't want to think about it. But, but he was prompted by Kate. She certainly got him thinking about it. And when he went down there to see her, I didn't want to, I didn't want to write that scene where he goes into the hospital room. And it was not in my first draft. And after two editors read it and did not consult, but came back with the same note, there needs to be a scene in there. So in that scene, I didn't want it to be grotesque. I did not want it to be morbid. Uh, so what I did was have him look at every single thing in the room except her. He looks at the window, he looks at the sink, he looks at the snow globe, he looks at the remote, so he looks at everything until he finally makes his way over to the life supporting monitors, then the two, and then, but I, he, he did what I think, I, again, what I would do, what most people would do, would the, be the avoidance for as long as possible. So we don't really know his reaction until the scene immediately following it and we see the impact it it had on him so i think that kate could never have forced him to do anything he didn't want to do but she certainly you know her her message she was the as he called her the herald from hell uh angel faced herald from hell but it was um uh, you know she forced him and probably he knew all along that that would have been a forgivable decision on his part. But uh, so it's a little bit of both, I think. I think she certainly had the influence and had she not come along, he probably would have left it alone. That was a very powerful scene, I have to say. Well, thank you. Let's see what else. The villain in the novel, it's pretty clear from the beginning. Were you ever <laughs> tempted to make the central story more of a mystery? Or were you always more interested just in these moral dilemmas? No, because I, I really, truly, you know, usually there is a big secret and there is a big secret at the end of this book uh, also, but it, it was never going to be a whodunit. It was, it was never going to be. And of course, it, later on, we find out exactly the sequence of events that took place in that bedroom. Um, so, but all along, I knew that Evan was just going to be, uh, an absolutely repulsive <laughs> individual and a sociopath and, uh, that in the long run, he, those people close to him would realize that they had created a monster that even they no longer wanted to live with, you know, um, but I, I thought, I, I knew from the beginning that it wasn't going to be the the secret part was not going to be 
who the who the criminal or the culprit was in this situation that we would know all along and that the real antagonist the real villain to me of this book is Zach's conscience it's not it's you know it Evan was kind of an embodiment of that but the real conflict with Zach is not even so much Evan as it is his own conscience and his own that conflict that as you say the moral dilemma that's the real villain in the book that's the thing he has to fight the hardest against who is your favorite character to write the football references and the puns were wonderful I loved them well I loved I love being every scene with being was the coach a uh, former coach was uh was fun to write just because he was he's the um uh, archetypal mentor uh and you know the curmudgeon the crusty you know but everything he said was smart <laughs> and and uh and we know that despite the fact that he frequently uh upbraids Zach for one thing or another he he loves him dearly and he wants to see him making the right decision and I think he disagreed with Zach's initial decision and it, it, from the beginning thought that Zach should have made a different one. As he even says, he said, you caved like a rookie. And and that's kind of the way he, oh, you know, he regarded he regarded Zach's decision. And what he really hated about it was how it continued to uh, hobble Zach. You know, he couldn't get over it. The decision had been made, it was done, but it was something that continued to, you know, keep him ensnared and from, you know, going on with his life. So that's what, you know, but I, I love the character being, uh, he was so soft-hearted, you know, with with Melinda when she comes along. So I, I really, those scenes were fun to write. Okay, enough about me, enough from me. Let's <laughs> look at some of these questions from readers. How do you get the ideas to develop your characters and plot for your stories? How do you start? And that is from Cherry Broom Broomfield. Thank you, Cherry. Uh, for sure. It's really hard to say. You probably, uh, you probably, would agree with maybe you would have but you meaning you kathy probably would agree that you don't really know where the ideas come from i mean they can come from you know something but that you hear or read or see and like i've explained where the idea for the you know this particular plot came from but Honestly, <laughs> some of the surprises as I'm going along in the book happen without my my knowledge that they're going to happen until it just comes out through my fingers. And I go, oh, that's pretty good. I didn't know that, you know. <laughs> and uh, so it, it sounds coy. Well, I don't know where the ideas come from, but I really, I don't. And they can come from it. And sometimes it's just in a snap. And sometimes, you know, you have to, pull them out like teeth so it's uh it's difficult to say but once I start with a character or a vague idea I put them in terrible trouble and then the story kind of evolves organically I know where I'm going I build in the spikes so I know where I'm going to start and I know where I'm going to finish and I know what tent poles have to be built up along the way but I don't know how I'm going to fill in all the blanks in between those. It just uh, that just kind of ha has to evolve, and most of it comes from the characters. They they're really smarter. They're smarter than I am. Water. <laughs> okay. Let's, what do we have here? What was the biggest challenge you faced while writing Overkill? That's from Elizabeth De Palma. The biggest challenge I had to face. Uh, well, figuring out what came next, uh, 
I, I, I had a lot of characters. Typically, I don't have this many characters, but in a way that helped because this could have been a story that was very static. Uh, it could have been, as I said, the villain was basically Zach's conscience and wrestling with this problem. Well, that could have gotten very boring. You know, he sits there and stews about it for days and days and days. So I had to build in um, action, things that people were doing building cause and effect so evan does this which it's that then that has to come out so it was uh it was thinking out uh, uh okay what what comes next which character can i go to that is going to propel this story and not make it about just somebody sitting and anguishing because that would have gotten boring real really quickly so i had to create action scenes i think that was probably the most challenging of this book. Let's see, Dana Kordsmeiser. <coughs> excuse me, Kordsmeiser. How do your plots evolve or change during the writing process? They're always so inventive and keep me guessing. And I am curious to know if you start with a fully fleshed idea or if the story changes as you write it. I think you just kind of told us a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I really just kind of really just kind of answered that. Uh, because some of the surprises, some of the things that, as I say, come out of my fingers onto the keyboard, I didn't see coming, or I didn't know. And I'll think, well, that's pretty good. For instance, just as a for instance, when the the three men, Evan and Cal and Theo, have their reunion dinner in the restaurant, they haven't seen each other since Evan's been sent to prison. So this is their first time. When Evan says, and Cal, you got married. Well, I didn't know until those words came out of his mouth that Cal was, was married. And I didn't know that he and Melinda, up to that point, I didn't know that they were going to become such an integral part of the plot. And uh, But once I, I got into that, then it, it gave, you know, it gave uh, more energy. It gave Eben something else to do that that demonstrated just how depraved he was and so uh but I didn't know until that scene that Cal even had a wife <laughs> so that'll that's an example of how things happen that you, you really don't see coming the deputy uh Dave Morris the deputy who again turned out to be play a very pivotal role and I didn't know he was going to until he showed up on Zach's front porch so uh, all of these things just kind of come out of the storytelling I do that as well but sometimes I'll go back and what were you thinking that's terrible <laughs> <laughs> well I, I I paint myself into corners I said like, okay you you started this now this character's looking at you like what? Tell me what to do. <laughs> oh, God, I don't know. You just showed up. <laughs> How long did it take you? This is from Aaron Miles. How long did it take you to finish Overkill? How long does it typically take you to finish writing a book? <clears throat> How much time do you spend on research alone? Three part uh, question. Well, I'm under, I'm under contract with my publisher for one book a year. Uh, I've been asked to do more, but this is a pretty comfortable pace for me because uh, I rewrite, rewrite, rewrite so much, and I have a life to live. I, I love my life, and and uh, so I don't want to overload myself. Uh, so one book a year is a pretty good, a pretty good pace. Do I write 365 days a year? No, although in some regards, as you know, we're always doing something. It's always, it's it's something. So even if I'm not writing, that doesn't mean I'm not working. I'm doing publicity or I'm doing research or I'm doing this or that. But it generally takes me about 10 months to actually put the book on paper because as I say, I, I do so much rewriting. I get the first draft and then I... I get notes on it from my editor, and then I go back through and through and through again and again and again. Uh, and the so I, I would say about 
about 10 months. And then the other two months I, I like to regard as downtime, you know, going on trips, doing stuff, <laughs> reading, catching up on all of the series that I've missed on TV because <laughs> I was working so hard. But uh, I think a writer never really stops working. You know, we're we're always constantly observing people, listening to things, reading. Uh, I probably read almost as many hours a day as I write. Um, so, and and research alone, uh, it depends on what the book is. If it's something that really requires me to know how to fly an airplane, you know, then I need to do a lot of research on that or get out of a, a loop, a legal loophole like I did on this book or research the uh, persistent vegetative state and what all that involves and entails and the diagnosis and all of that. So this required a lot of research. Brian, Blind Tiger certainly did because I was writing historical and I had to learn how to make moonshine. <laughs> but um, so it just depends on the story as to how much research is required. Here's an interesting one. If you could be one person in your book, who would you be and why? I know who you probably wouldn't want to be. <laughs> <laughs> if I could be one person in the book? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Um, well, I wouldn't mind being the Super Bowl MVP <laughs> quarterback. I mean, if we're going to, you know, pick something. But I also, I liked Kate's character very much. Uh, I liked Melinda's character very much. I thought she was, uh, I thought she was a strong woman. And, uh, you know, so uh, I guess I would have to say, though, Kate, I admired her, her acumen, certainly, but also her persistent, her not bowing to a uh, convention, not ca not caving into her boss, uh, which could have cost her her job. Uh, so I thought she was pretty savvy. I could admire Kate. I like the truck she drove. <laughs> <laughs> One from Carla DeWalt. What do you love most about the world of mystery and suspense and darkness? Well, I always had to be so disgustingly good when I was growing up. <laughs> I was the, I was the goody two shoes. I was the straight A student, you know, student council, all of that. Also had four younger sisters, so I was the oldest child. Always had to set the example. Uh, and so, to me, a fun part about writing suspense and writing mysteries is like writing a character like Evan, because you really get to, to go into the mind of somebody who has no remorse, no guilt. Uh, they're not carrying, you know, any kind of baggage with them. And so writing the villains is is a lot of fun for me. I guess it's an alter ego that I that I very rarely let seep out in my real life. <laughs> Here's one from Jasmine Arce, perhaps. Are you a crime junkie yourself? Yes. Yes. I, I think we're, uh, I don't know what it is about human nature. You could probably answer that better than I could, Kathy, but why are we so fascinated with yeah. the criminal mind? Why are we so, uh, and, and so I watch a lot of, you know, true crime. I lead, read a lot of true crime uh, just because it's it does fascinate us. And I, I don't know why, uh, but it's a psychological, uh, you know, thing about human nature. We just we we like to watch bad people do bad things. I, I don't know why that is. <laughs> and get caught, right? And get okay. caught. Here's a good one. Uh, Kate Fauscher, Fauche, Fauscher. What's your favorite snack to munch on whilst you're writing? Oh, I eat uh, almonds. Roasted, <laughs> roasted, unsalted almonds. Uh, they keep my energy up. And so uh, every once in a while, I'll have peanut butter. 
but uh, I don't like to eat a lot when I'm writing because I get sleepy. And so I just, I do much. I'll go to the fridge and get maybe, you know, handful of almonds and some blueberries or something like that. Well, <laughs> I'll go get a snack. <laughs> <What's the same? laughs> this is from Lori Johnston. What's the single best piece of advice on writing you have received? Well, my my first editor, I was getting all nervous. This goes back years and years and years ago, a woman named Vivian Stevens. And I was worried about uh, publicity. I was worried, I was worrying about, should I be, this is when, you know, people would take boxes of donuts to the truck drivers that put the, you know, distributed the books and everything. And so I said, do I need to be, you know, doing bookmarks? Do I need to be signing postcards? Do I need to be taking them donuts? Da, da, da. And I was thinking about all this other stuff. And she said, if you get the world's attention, you better have something good to say. And her point was, write, concentrate on the book. And all of that other stuff will take care of itself. A good book will be found. But it doesn't matter how much publicity you do, how much, if, if you're publicizing a bad book, <laughs> then what has it gained you? So she said, you're putting the cart before the horse. Don't worry about that write a the best book you possibly can so that's the that's the best advice that I can recall right off the top of my head but it was also pretty profound advice and I've told every aspiring writer who's come to me and said you know what's the secret and I'll go how hard do you want to work because when it boils down to it you can only put one word on the page at a time and if there's a shortcut to that, I don't know what it is. I haven't found it. And so to anyone who aspires to write, who's watching us today and listening, uh, concentrate on the work. And and it's it's the unsexy part for sure. <laughs> but it, it's essential. Write, write the book. Think about that before you think about everything else. Uh are you working on a new book and what is it? Not yet. I, uh, I have, uh, I'm playing with an idea, but I knew that, you know, from today forward for the next few weeks and leading up to publication, you know, how much is required of us uh, leading up to publication. There's a lot of work to be done in preparation for the publication of a book. So I, I kind of took a time out downtime and I'll get serious uh, <laughs> the day after Labor Day, <laughs> which coincides with about the time the tour is over and I can, you know, settle in and really start concentrating. Tell us about the tour. Will you be physically touring? Traveling? Yes, this is, a, this is the first time in three years. The, the last time was 2019 at this time of year. I think it may have been September 2019. And uh, so this is the first time out on the road. I'll be going to uh, Houston tomorrow to murder by the book. Then the poison pen in Scottsdale uh, on Thursday. Then I come home for the weekend and then I'll be Dallas, Cleveland and uh, Delaware. Then Winston-Salem, then Austin. So <laughs> it's kind of spread out, but. I'll be, you know, going out on jaunts two or three days at a time. That's not too bad. No, it's fun no. once you get there. It's the travel that's. Yeah, you know, yeah. And I'm, I'm kind of concerned, of course, about the airline disarray right now. Uh, so I'm hoping that all of my connections are made and that all the flights are on time. But uh, my publicist works very carefully on it. My assistant works with him on it to make sure that, you know, it's as easy on me as it can possibly be. But, you know, it it, it can't help but be a little bit grueling. <laughs> Don't check a bag. That would be my advice. Right, right. Just wear the same thing. Repeat. Right, several <laughs> times. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. What's... Um... 
What books did you read as a child and what are you currently reading or would recommend for a mystery thriller lover? That may well, be I would recommend that you read Kathy Wrights and <laughs> Sandra Brown and, and all of our colleagues. Uh, but um, when I was a child, my, my mother read to my sisters and me before we, we could read for ourselves. And she was a real romantic and she read you know, she she read fairy tales, Grimm's, and and um, and books that she had loved, and and she really influenced my reading all my life. Uh, and she loved she loved stories, she loved adventure, she loved mysteries to an extent, but mostly just good, juicy, meaty books. I grew up on Erwin um, Shaw and um, the ones who wrote Irving Stone and the ones who wrote, you know, these historical novels, lush historical novels, Frank G. Slaughter, uh, Richard Llewellyn. Um, but my one of my favorites was uh, Taylor Caldwell. And uh, of course, she came later when I was young adult. Uh, having children, even. I remember I got one of her books from a friend when I had my Rachel, my daughter Rachel, and I read it and in the hospital, and oh, it was just so good. So then I went back and read all of Taylor Caldwell. So all of these, you know, uh, influenced me in, in one way or another. Good. Sandra, are we supposed to wrap up at 345? Is that, do I have our instructions? Oh, that, that's, I think that's about right. <laughs> okay. So um, anything else you want to add or say about the book or your tour? Well, first of all, I want to thank Barnes & Noble for uh, giving us this chance for you and I to chat for one thing and see each other and another for opening up, you know, this, uh, this virtual event for me to have an opportunity to speak with fans that may not be able to attend an event in person. And thanks, Barnes and Noble for the promotion that they've given Overkill. I hope we sell a whole lot of copies of it for everyone's good. And thank you, Kathy, for giving up your time. Thank you, Sandra. <laughs> and uh, if you order your books with Barnes and Noble, I believe you'll get them within eight to 10 days. Yes, that's right. And they even have some autographed ones. They even have some signed ones. Not So if you visit barnesandnoble.com. I'm sure you can find out all that information. Very good. And you have a website, you're on social media and people can. Yep. Twitter, Instagram, uh, website, and uh, all of that. Not too hard to find. So <laughs> Very good. Very good. Well, I think that's it. I think we're done. Have a great Thank you, Have a great Thank lunch. You. And hopefully we'll maybe I can see you when you're in Winston-Salem. My best to your family. Take Thank care. You. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye, -bye.